I was one of the first people way back in 2015 to say Americans should move to Mexico rather than to Canada. You've seen a lot of Americans, Canadians, and people from all around the world go to Mexico for more personal freedom and a lower cost of living. But now I'm taking it one step further. I would actually rather be a Mexican citizen than a US citizen, and I'm gonna tell you why. This is a map of all the countries that U.S. citizens can visit without obtaining a visa or with easily obtaining an e-visa. This is the map for Mexico, and this is the map for Argentina. Different countries all throughout the Americas, and you would think the United States would have far more travel privileges than other countries that are in Latin America. But the reality is that's not the case. Now, we've talked before for many years about how U.S. citizenship has baggage. Americans are unique in that they have to continue filing tax returns, reporting bank accounts, and following certain U.S. regulations, even when they live and do business overseas. Now, Americans can still reduce their taxes overseas legally to as low as 0%, but there's more baggage. There's more things about being American that follow you that a country like Mexico or Argentina or any other country in Latin America, or the world for that matter, doesn't impose. But I wanna talk about countries that are in the U.S.'s backyard, in the U.S.'s hemisphere, and talk about how there's actually not that much difference between legacy brand countries like the United States, where numbers and metrics are actually falling, and countries like Mexico, where numbers and metrics are going up. In the 21st century, we're seeing countries that 20, 30, 50 years ago would have been totally written off as places to live, places that you want to be a citizen of. Now they're increasingly competitive. Look at where Mexicans can go compared to the U.S. You really only see two big standouts on that map. You see the United States and you see Australia. Now there are a handful of other countries that Mexicans can't visit uh, that Americans can. And there are a few places that Mexicans can visit uh, that Americans can't. One of the things that I think is going to become increasingly important in a multipolar world is what is my country's geopolitical reputation? Everyone knows the United States and that's historically been very good. Countries that wanna welcome Americans, but that kind of stopped in the last one to two decades where banks no longer want Americans in many cases. There are plenty of banks that take Americans, but some of the well-known asset havens have just shut the door on Americans due to rules like FATCA. I think you're going to increasingly see that in things like immigration. If you want to get a residence permit somewhere else, you're going to see more restrictions. You're already seeing a certain retaliation on the U.S. from other places in terms of their own travel policies. I have seen Americans have more difficulty getting certain residence permits than citizens of other countries that you wouldn't really think you'd want to be a citizen of, but it was actually easier because they were able to get the documents needed more easily. And so the reality is we've seen, especially in the last few years during COVID, the United States has not been that responsive to its citizens. Meanwhile, myself and some of my friends and team members do things like get our passports renewed in one day at a time when Americans were waiting six to 12 months to do that. And so you thought, oh, being American, having that top tier, what we would call tier A travel document, where you can pretty much go anywhere in the world, that's not only fading as Europe's Schengen area is imposing new, relatively easy, not too much to worry about, but nevertheless restrictions on Americans who are visiting next year. But you see that Mexico has done an incredible job at increasing its passport's power, particularly in the last 20 years, to where Mexicans can now go to Canada. We've advised our clients who are Canadian who are worried that one day their country will tax them on a worldwide basis, that it's maybe not a bad idea to get residents in Mexico. Even if you don't live there, that's an opportunity to move there in the future. You can become naturalized in Mexico and you can visit Canada uh, as a tourist, as a Mexican citizen in the future, if Canada became so difficult to its citizens. Many countries treat tourists better than they treat their own citizens. And so Mexico's done an incredible job People in the United States don't often realize actually how much wealth Mexico has. Uh, there's really not that much of a difference, except that Mexicans uh, are able to leave their country. And there are a few conditions if you're a Mexican tax resident for leaving, but generally speaking, much easier to leave Mexico and travel all around the world and live all around the world freely than it is as an American. Now let's look at Argentina, a country that you see the headlines in the United States. It's an economic basket case. They have problems. Doug Casey, who has spoken now for three years at Nomad Capitals Live, has lived in Argentina. He said, listen, they just leave me alone as the, the wealthy foreigner. Look at Argentina's passport power. Every single country in Europe is lit up. They can go everywhere. Same as Americans and actually even better. Why? Because Argentina is not bothering other countries. And so people look at Argentina. Their citizens aren't a visa overstay risk. Uh, they're not causing problems. 
they have uh, money by the standards of most uh, people, most countries. And so you may not want to go visa-free to Russia. Uh, I understand that's not maybe the best place to go right now. But the point is, if you're a citizen of Argentina, you have almost as many options. You've got a couple main countries that are, that are not there. I would argue, for me, I don't want to go to Canada. I don't want to go to Australia. I don't want to go to New Zealand. I would rather have access to countries that welcome me, that have friendly policies, that have low taxes, what I call soft freedom. And so I'm not saying you have to live in these countries, but let's understand, if you're watching this, you now have the opportunity to get residence and to get citizenship in other countries that you may not have to live in, but you can travel around the world and you can have that as your identity. Now, when it comes to opening bank accounts, if you're an American, you're an American, even if you have 99 other passports when it comes to things like FATCA. So that's one area where it's an issue. But let's say in the cryptocurrency space, for example, there are certain crypto exchanges, there are certain crypto investments. Hey, we don't mind if you're an American, but we need you to have some kind of ID from somewhere else. And so we've had people who are American come to us to get second residences and passports to have access to investments that they're legally allowed to access, but they need some kind of alternate ID. And so there are situations like that. There are situations where you may want to travel somewhere, get residence somewhere. I'd rather be a citizen of a country that's not bothering everybody, that doesn't have restrictions, that doesn't have a record of, oh, they're always screwing with us. Because you can see Mexicans, Argentines, they're welcome to go to Europe, and they're welcome in the same conditions uh, that Americans are. They will follow the same new procedures, what's called EDIUS, for having to go to the Europe Schengen area in 2024. They enjoy the same 90 days out of every 180 days. And quite frankly, I have seen no evidence that if I'm Mexican, I'm going to have any harder time getting a residence permit almost anywhere else in the world, except, I suppose, the United States. But here's the reality. The fact that a country like Mexico has grown so substantially in terms of its passport power, uh, in terms of its wealth, Latin American countries haven't grown as fast as Asian countries compared to the U.S., so there is that. But countries like Mexico and others that are, have been emerging in our lifetimes are an example of how countries are getting closer to each other. Now look at the U.S. I was talking to folks at our recent event who have moved to Mexico. They get asked two questions. Is it safe? And how do you deal with health care? Those are the two that stood out above all the others from Americans and Canadians who moved to Mexico. Is it safe? How do you get health care? The reality is those things, in many cases, are better in those countries than in uh, the United States. And what the people told me in some cases was, name a city in the U.S. that's safe these days. Now, you don't live in that city. You live in the suburbs. But, hey, I live in the suburbs of where I live in Mexico. I live in a safe part of Mexico. My doctor comes and takes care of me in my house. I've got my doctor's cell phone number. You don't have that in the U.S. And so you can live in Mexico. You can live in Argentina. Many people are choosing to do that. Lower cost of living, more soft freedom. You get left alone. If you, if you think the safety is an issue, fine. Find the Mexico of Asia. Find the Mexico of Eastern Europe. Find the, there's plenty of countries around the world that meet your conditions. But the point is, countries are coming together. When I was a kid, I've told you all for years, we would watch on television. Oh, look at the Chinese. They're riding their bicycles around Beijing. They're not riding so many bicycles anymore. And yet the U.S. life expectancy is plateaued. Economic freedom is down. Personal freedom is down. University standings and education is down. Wages are stagnant. Economy is growing okay, but a lot of other economies are growing much faster. Optimism about the country down in the dumps. Not the case in many other countries. I'd rather be a citizen of a place that's moving up that has great visa-free travel, where I can live there if I want. Let's talk about Argentina, for example. You have access to basically all of South America. You can go there with an ID card. You can more easily get residence permits, for example. And so I left the U.S. many years ago, and every time I think, well, you know, maybe this would be easier than the U.S., I talk to a friend or family member who said, it's only gotten worse. The place doesn't function anymore. If I can be Mexican, let's say I'm going to give birth to a child in Mexico. Let's say I just go and get a residence permit and spend a couple of years living in Mexico. And I learn Spanish and I can become a naturalized citizen. Or let's say I have a parent from Mexico and I'm already entitled to Mexican citizenship. I don't have to live in Mexico. But if I have U.S. level or Western country level resources, income, a business, I could live in Mexico. I can live in a safe part or Argentina or any other country you want that has a good passport and I can have more freedom geopolitically, financially. And if I want to leave that country and go anywhere else in the world, there's Mexicans in Singapore. I don't think Singapore looks at them very differently. There's Mexicans in Dubai. I don't think Dubai looks at them any differently than they do an American or Canadian or an Australian. 
they're a foreigner. Their reputation outside of the U.S. of a country like Mexico is actually, you know, pretty decent. Mexico City, Buenos Aires are great cities. But again, you don't have to live there. There is going to be more business opportunities. There's going to be more opportunities to structure your international plan, in my opinion, having some of these citizenships. Now, what you can do, what we suggest people do, and what we help people do here is get second citizenships. And I think really now, third citizenship. So we've got Americans who are living in Mexico part-time or who have Mexican residents, and in some number of years, they'll be able to apply for Mexican citizenship. They will be able to hold Mexican and American, Mexican and Canadian, Mexican and Australian, whatever the case may be. And so that could be one passport you get. At the same time, some of those folks are setting up golden visas in Europe, and they're going to work towards citizenship there. Or they've got an ancestor from Europe where they can get citizenship by descent. We help people do that. Some people are getting citizenship by investment in the Caribbean or other places, and they're building their passport portfolios. I can tell you this. I've traveled as a St. Lucian. I've traveled on other passports. I really haven't gotten, haven't had any issues. In fact, sometimes I've had more issues as an American. I've been asked more questions as an American. You know, this idea that your U.S. passport or your Canadian passport or your Australian passport is some, you know, perfect thing, it's really not the case anymore because, uh, Passports like Serbia, passports like Mexico, like Argentina have made incredible strides. Countries even in Central America, people in the crypto space have talked about El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala has a, a program for residents where you don't have to live there all the time, but you can get citizenship. Those are pretty good quality passports. Those are not quite as good as Mexico's, but the reality is the places that you're looking down on have a lot fewer restrictions if you can choose wherever you want to live. A lot easier to live wherever you want to live, whether it's for tax reasons or personal freedom or lifestyle outside of your country. And so really, that's the game. I don't want you to stay in the US your entire life because of the best country when all the metrics are going down. I want you to find a place to go. And when you decide to do that, I'd much rather have a passport that's lesser known, that offers me more freedom than the one that everybody knows.